Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Lewis, and I'm the chair of the Department of Political Science. On behalf of the Department of Political Science, it is my pleasure and distinct honor to welcome you to today's program, the third annual E. Victor Wolfenstein Memorial Lecture. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, members of Victor's family here tonight, um, as well as so many of our colleagues and friends, and so many of you that helped to underwrite the fund that supports the lecture. We're continuing to secure the support necessary to make this, um, to make this lecture a marquee event for our department and for UCLA for years to come, and I'd be happy to talk uh, to any of you after the, uh, after the program this evening um, about that effort. Held annually, the lecture uh, brings renowned scholars doing innovative work on the fundamental questions of justice, race, history, and their representation in theory, music, and literature that animated Victor's scholarship. I'd particularly um, like to thank uh, Judy Wolfenstein and Gabe Wolfenstein for their efforts and their vision that led to the formation of this lecture. I would also like to say a special thank you to our Chief Administrative Officer, Stephanie Ariaza, and Events Coordinator, Belinda Sunu, as well as the College Development staff for their um, hard work in putting this event together for us tonight. Immediately following the program, there will be a reception uh, just outside on the patio, and everyone's in <coughs> invited to continue the discussion uh, there at that time. Uh, today's speaker will be introduced to you by our own Melvin Rogers. Uh, since the last Wolfenstein lecture, uh, Melvin, uh, who is jointly appointed in political science and African American studies, has been named the first holder of the newly created Scott Waugh Chair in the Division of Social Science. Yeah. I, I was going to brag on him a little more before you clapped, but um, uh, this, this makes uh, Melvin one of only three endowed chairs uh, in political science, and uh, I should say that the chair was established in, uh, in honor of Executive Vice Chancellor Waugh uh, through a generous gift from, Mel <coughs> from Meyer and Renee Luskin and, uh, and, and Ralph and Shirley Shapiro. Um, Yes, thank, thank you for, for, for recognizing this, this wonderful accomplishment um, uh, for, for Melvin. Melvin joined us uh, from Emory University in 2014, and he's made an immediate and important intellectual impact on our scholarly community, graduate training, and undergraduate teaching. Uh, he's a rising star in the field and a cornerstone of our political theory program. Uh, Melvin's teaching and research uh, is in the area of political philosophy, with a focus on little d Democrat and big R Republican theory, uh, little r Republican, th we need some big R Republican theory, um, I think, these days, but we need a little, um, little r Republican theory from Melvin. Uh, American and African American political thought and issues of religion, race, and gender. He's the author of The Undiscovered Dewey, Religion, Morality, and the Ethos of Democracy, and his articles appear in such prestigious outlets as Political Theory, The American Political Science Review, and Philosophy and Social Criticism. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Melvin Rogers. Well, I am delighted to see uh, all of you here this evening. Um, last night, I was trying to uh, figure out a way to uh, introduce uh, our speaker today. And so I was sitting in front of a number of books by Charles Mills. Uh, I had been working uh, through them uh, late last week for some other projects. And off in the distance, I saw another book um, it was face down, it was open, uh, the title of which was The Price of the Ticket. And I thought to myself, oh, I found my way to introduce Charles Mills. In his book of essays, The Price of the Ticket, novelist, essayist, and dare I say philosopher James Baldwin reflected on the problem of our racial past and our inability to confront it. The truth about the past, our racial past, Baldwin wrote, is not that it is too brief or too superficial, but only that we, having turned our faces so resolutely away from it, have never demanded from it what it has to give." End quote. For Baldwin, what the past has to offer, as he often said, is an opportunity to confront our racial reality, a reality that gives life to and helps explain our present moment. No contemporary philosophical voice better channels Baldwin's commitment to confront us with our racial past and its effects on our present than our Wolfenstein lecturer this evening, Charles Mills. 
His has been an attempt to reshape and redeploy liberal political philosophy by making the tradition more clearly aware of the ways in which it has consistently and voluntarily devalued the status of non-white peoples. In doing so, he exposes again and again the racial presuppositions of the political tradition we find ourselves living today with the hope that it might prepare our transformation. Professor Mills is the John Evans Professor of Moral and Intellectual Philosophy at Northwestern University. He has held previous positions at the University of Oklahoma and the University of Illinois at Chicago before joining Northwestern. He works in the area of social and political philosophy broadly with focuses on the areas of class, gender, and race. He is the author of several books, including Radical Theory, Caribbean Reality, Race, Class, and Social Domination of 2010, Contract and Domination, co-authored with our own Carol Pateman of 2007, From Class to Race, Essays in White Marxism and Black Radicalism, 2003, Blackness Visible Essays on Philosophy and Race, 1998, and more than 50 articles in leading journals and books in philosophy and political science. But it is his signature 1997 book, The Racial Contract, for which he won the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award that remains his first, although not his last, claim to fame. With book sales well over 25,000 and still climbing, the book has been widely adopted in courses across the United States, across more than 100 campuses, and in courses in philosophy, political science, African American studies, sociology, and anthropology. Of this book, the major journal of philosophical ethics, ethics said, this is a significant and compelling work in a modest compass of an extended essay, Mills succeeds in altering our view of modern political thought. Please join me in welcoming this year's Wolfenstein lecturer, Charles Mills, who will discuss liberalism and racial justice. Well, thanks to Melvin for that very, very generous introduction, for the political science department, for the invitation, and of course to the Wolfensteins you know, for the honor of my, you know, um, having me deliver this lecture. I'd like to start off with a shout out to my um, co-author, Carol Pateman, who, as uh, Melvin points out, um, inspired my book, my main claim to fame. Not quite a one-hit wonder, he's too generous to say that, but um, somewhat. So she's sitting there at the back, so please, Carol Pateman, the inspiration of my book, The Racial Contract. <laughs> And also, of course, a sneaky plug for the book I did with her, Contract and Domination, available at all better bookstores and at Amazon. <laughs> Actually, there are no, no bookstores left, available at Amazon. <laughs> okay, so my title is, a title one should not choose if one is prone to stammer, as I am on occasion, liberalizing illiberal liberalism, and then after they called on liberalism and racial justice. And there's a handout, but I hope you won't take that as an excuse to sort of you know, rush out of the room immediately. At least wait a decent interval, I don't know, half an hour or so. So as the title indicates, I'm trying to answer the question, how should progressives relate to liberalism, which is now hegemonic global political ideology? And as the title indicates, I think we should try to retrieve liberalism. But this, I'm going to suggest, will require more work than is conventionally assumed. And my basic claim will once we recognize in full depth and detail how illiberal actual historic liberalism has been, we will need not merely to remap our conventional periodizations, but to rethink the received account and characterization of liberalism as a political ideology. It's ontology and axiology, sorry about this, but you know, the APA, American Philosophical Association, monitors all talks given by philosophers. So if you don't mention ontology, they may sort of pull your membership. So I have sort of sneak that in there. I know it's a political theory. It's ontology and axiology with corresponding implications for how we should theorize about justice and social contract tradition. So obviously then, I have two sets of opponents. Those who think liberalism cannot be retrieved so Marxists, communitarians, post-structuralists, multiculturalists, post-colonial theorists, and those mainstream types who think liberalism is just fine as it is and needs no modification. 
So it means that there's a bunch of people who, you know, cross the street when they see me coming, and when they're on sort of, you know, both sides of the street, it sort of makes it awkward for me, because there's sort of no way for me to sort of get around meeting some of them. That Charles Mills, he once had these radical pretensions, and now he's sold out, and for God's sake, he's turned into a liberal. But please, bear with me, because I hope to convince you that liberalism has more potential than commonly thought. Okay, so I start off with a characterization of a very respectable source, somebody all you guys will know as a well-known political theorist, the British political theorist John Gray. So I'm going to sort of read this passage from him, and bear in mind that's a somewhat um, dated passage, so you know, the, the gender language is his rather than mine. <coughs> so this is Gray's characterization of liberalism, sort of getting at the essentials. Common to all variants of the liberal tradition is a definite conception, distinctively modern in character, of man and society. It is individualist in that it asserts the moral primacy of the person against the claims of any social collectivity. It is egalitarian in as much as it confers on all men the same moral status and denies relevance to legal or political order of differences in moral worth among human beings. It is universalist, affirming the moral unity of the human species and according a secondary importance to specific historical associations and cultural forms, and it is meliorist in its affirmation of the corrigibility and improvability of all social institutions and political arrangements. It is this conception of man and society which gives liberalism a definite identity which transcends its vast internal variety and complexity. So you can sort of think of that depending on whether your metaphors go from the bottom up or from the top down, as like the kind of roots of liberalism, and then you get a tree which branches out in many different ways, many varieties, or, or, or on the other hand, you could think of it as kind of a genus, that's liberalism there, and sort of subdividing into different species. So there are different conceptions of individualism, different claims about how egalitarianism should be realized, more or less inclusion and readings of universalism, and of course, Gray's characterization underplays sort of long history of liberalism, sexual and, sexual and racist history, and then different views of what count as desirable improvements and competing theoretical prognoses about how best they can be realized in the light of this history. So there's a huge potential for disagreement about all these issues, and that's how a common liberal core or a common liberal genus can then produce such a wide range of variants. So consider some of the liberalisms that are familiar to us. There's Lockean liberalism versus Kantian liberalism. There's contractarian liberalism versus utilitarian liberalism. There's left-wing versus right-wing liberal theory. There's roles between between comprehensive and political liberalism. Those are all familiar. Now consider some that are somewhat less familiar. Actual historic liberalism versus retroactively sanitized liberalism. You know, it's a liberalism that's basically sort of cleaned up for public relations purposes. The kind of liberalism you know, that we teach our students. <laughs> ideal theory liberalism versus non-ideal theory liberalism. Patriarchal liberalism versus feminist liberalism. Imperial liberalism versus anti-imperial liberalism. Racial liberalism versus non-racial liberalism. Colorblind liberalism versus color conscious liberalism. And perhaps if you sort of gather all of these under two big umbrellas, dominant existing conservative liberalism, illiberal, illiberalism versus reconstructed radical liberalism. So my case is basically going to be that liberalism has its potential for radicalization, but what's going to require of us is a kind of distancing a kind of cognitive estrangement from sort of dominant forms of liberal theory so that we can then recognize that the reason liberalism looks the way it does is because of the fact of you know, the sort of preponderance of particular groups in its shaping and that a different kind of liberalism is possible. So if we're asked to analyze liberalism, what will its crucial components be? I suggest there are you know, five crucial components. There's a set of value commitments. There's a certain social ontology. There's a conceptual cartography of the sociopolitical. There's a theory, or maybe just an account of history. And finally, there's a schedule of rights, protections, and freedoms. So the least controversial is the first part. As we all know, liberalism is supposedly committed to the moral equality, freedom, and self-realization of individuals. B, the ontology, that's a bit more contested. Classically from the political left, liberalism is accused of having an ontology of atomic individuals, but this has been challenged. Liberalism is basically committed not to 
um, descriptive individualism, that is the individual sort of lifted out of society and history, but moral individualism, the individual as a locus of moral value. Then um, the conceptual cartography, that's going to sort of how you map the territory. A theory of history, well, liberalism is classically associated with a kind of you know, weak version of progressivism, but obviously a belief that morality and rationality should prevail does not at all commit one to the belief that they actually do. So we can sort of detach that from it. And then finally, the sort of seemingly boring boilerplate, rule of law, due process, freedom of association, freedom of worship, all that stuff very familiar to us, but ask yourself, how would this boilerplate have to be revised if some of the preceding components were altered? So my suggestion is that apart from A, the value commitments, everything else is variable, and in fact, A is variable too, depending on who is taken to count as an individual in the first place. And the implication is that with different social ontologies, corresponding cartographies and accounts of history, in conjunction with the minimal value commitments, that could produce liberalisms quite different, quite unfamiliar to us. So we need to sort of ask ourselves, why has liberalism evolved the way it, it has done? Well, before an audience of political theorists, I don't have to make the case. In front of my normal audience of philosophers, more effort is required, because philosophers like to think of themselves as disincarnate, and sort of you know, following the sort of platonic dictum, you know, you sort of leave the body behind with its corrupting appetites, go to the world of the forms, do this 12-step program, do math, <laughs> etc., all the way up. So you, know, you leave the body behind. Political sciences, you guys know better. So it will not surprise you to hear that I think that the ideational is fundamentally shaped by the material. And ideas and concepts and values, they don't develop on their own through a kind of intellectual parthenogenesis in a celestial platonic realm, but they're going to be shaped by the material embodiment and embeddedness of these thinkers, their interests, their experiences, their group positioning as privileged or subordinated. And what do we know? We know that in the West, the recognized political thinkers and philosophers have been largely male and class privileged and overwhelmingly white. Thus, we would expect the dominant variety of liberalism to be patriarchal, classist, and racial, with corresponding implications for A, B, C, D, and E. And there's this great book by an Italian philosopher, a guy called Domenico Lasordo, that was translated a few years ago. It's a kind of, you know, expose of liberalism, sort of all this sleazy stuff you suspected, but far more, sort of, and even worse stuff. I and mean, not merely the exclusions of gender and race, but even the white male working class, sort of, you know, not achieving liberal status, in some cases, until sort of late 19th or early 20th century. And basically, if you sort of follow Lasordo's argument and sort of put together what are normally represented as anomalies and deviations, then what you come to is the unavoidable conclusion that the dominant varieties of historic liberalism excluded the majority of the world's population from equal normative consideration. And what's the implication of that? If exclusion is modal rather than being peripheral, if propertied white males are the major beneficiaries of modernity's liberalization, then how can the conventional narrative, the narrative, I dare say, so, so as we tell our students still, of a shift from the world of hierarchical estates to a world of equal individuals be sustained? Otherwise put, liberalism has historically been illiberalism for all but a minority. So shouldn't our periodization be changed to reflect this reality? And here, I've provided for you a useful cutout which you can put on your refrigerator door, on your kitchen door, on your bathroom door, the place where you do your heavy thinking. And this basically sort of sums up my thesis. So in the top diagram, we have the conventional periodization. And the conventional periodization is a shift from the world of illiberalism to the world of liberalism. So we have pre-modern inegalitarian ideologies of various kinds, of you know, um, classical and feudal ascriptive hierarchy, and then you know, the sort of you know, bells of freedom ring loud. We have the American and French revolutions, and we get modern egalitarian ideology, and we're sort of ushered triumphantly into the world of individuals. Would that it were so, but as we know, it's not. So that brings us to the more realistic bottom diagram, and that's where you need to sort of focus your attention. And the revisionist periodization I'm suggesting is a shift between illiberalism version one to illiberalism versus two, which is known as liberalism. 
So we have pre-modern inegalitarian ideologies of the ancient and medieval world, and we then have a modern inegalitarian ideology. We have modern ascriptive hierarchy that's bourgeois, patriarchal, and racial. So we have the property and the non-property, we have men and women, and we have whites and non-whites. So once we sort of look at liberalism from this perspective, once we sort of put at center stage the exclusions rather than marginalizing them and sweeping them under the rug, we then get a radically different history of liberalism and we should also get a radically different conceptualization of it. So this I suggest is a sort of far more useful framework for understanding the history of liberalism for those who are seeking to retrieve it. Because we need to recognize how deeply group privilege has shaped what we think of as liberalism in its fundamental values and taxonomies and cartographies so that to retrieve liberalism for a progressive agenda would then require a correspondingly profound reshaping. So we need to rewrite the history of liberalism so its exclusions are highlighted rather than marginalized. And of course, a lot of work has been done about some by feminist theorists. We need to sort of make clear rather than obfuscate the role of the canonical theorists in justifying these exclusions. We need to put at center stage, rather than have an off stage, the shaping by group privilege of these nominally abstract values and ontology and so forth. And we then need to sort of self-consciously rethink all of these to achieve genuine liberal justice. So the big three, you consider the um, feminist liberal critique. People are not atomic individuals, but members of, um, sorry, the social democratic critique, members of classes, freedom and equality not realizing for the majority under lesser fare the economic power of the privilege translates to political power, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, to the astonishment, I'm sure, of all of you, even though uh, many of you are professional political theorists, we have, for God's sake, a democratic socialist running and not being sort of you know, driven off in a stage with red-baiting accusations, but actually pulling in millions of dollars. Somewhat less so most recent with sort of last defeat, but still, that he could have lasted so long is an astonishing in itself. So, so the social democratic critique <coughs> More familiar, of course, from a European perspective than the US, but it goes to show that things have now reached a stage of plutocracy here, that you even sort of have the need for this sort of new perspective. Feminist liberal critique, again, very familiar. The critique I suggest, which is the undeveloped one, is a racial critique. And the racial critique is basically saying that the same kind of moves that have been made by feminists, the same kind of moves that have been made by left liberals slash social democrats, we need to make a sort of comparable sort of rethinking and sort of reconceptualization of liberal theory. And it's only on this basis that we'll actually be able to sort of achieve a liberalism that's going to be properly equipped to sort of deal with matters of racial justice. So I'm sort of skip, skipping a bit for those who have fallen on the handout because of time constraints. Okay, so bottom, of pa bottom half of page four, racial justice. Why is racial critique so undeveloped in the academy, in political theory and in political philosophy, in comparison with the social democratic critique and the feminist critique. Well, I'll speak about philosophy. Um, are there any philosophers present? Well, there are a few. I was hoping to make nasty remarks that would not get back to philosophy. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, go I'm going to do it just the same. Okay, so I suggest that there are two factors, basically. First is historical recency of race as a reality and then the demographer of the profession. So gender, gender injustice, they've existed for thousands of years. So the non-discussion of them in the literature or the sexist discussion is more culpable. But the standard scholarly judgment on race with a few dissenters is that race is a product of the modern world, not merely as a category, but as a social reality. Maybe ethnocentrism existed, maybe color prejudice existed, maybe religious bigotry existed, but race is a product of modernity. So you could then argue as a philosopher, look, from the long view, sort of going 2,000 plus years of the Western tradition, race occupies a small section of it, race is therefore not as significant as these other areas. But to begin with, they're dissenters. And for those who really want to sort of follow this stuff in detail, let me recommend to you a huge book by an Israeli classicist, a guy called Benjamin Isaac, The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity. And there's also a follow-up volume credited by Isaac and other folks who have a similar view. And the title of Isaac's book is sort of self-consciously a challenge to the conventional view. And he says that this idea that race comes into existence only with modernity, that's quite wrong goes back to ancient Greece, and for him, the pioneering racist theorist of the Western tradition is none other than Aristotle. 
Because as we all remember, Aristotle says they're natural slaves. These natural slaves are ethnically marked. So according to Isaac's conceptualization, this makes them a pioneering racist. So if you take that line of argument, the sort of challenge, the conventional periodization, it then means that philosophers will be forced to admit that in fact racism is virtually coextensive with the tradition. So you can no longer dismiss race as a sort of minor, very time-bound reality, because race goes back as long as the tradition does. But what I'm going to suggest is that even if this revisionist analysis does not prove to be vindicated, there's still a case for taking race and racial justice seriously. And here are some obvious reasons. To begin with, if racial injustice is an injustice distinctive to modernity, it should be of interest for that very reason, given the huge amount of scholarship in recent years trying to articulate how the modern differs from the pre-modern. So if race and racial injustice come into existence with the modern, that makes them of interest for that very reason. Second, to make the obvious point, racial injustice has involved great atrocities, slavery, genocide, indigenous expropriation, precisely at the time when human moral equality was supposed to be broadly established. And then on a global scale, if you see the modern world as being shaped, as I don't see any reasonable person could deny, by European imperialism and colonialism, then you can make a case that racial injustice has significantly affected the fate of the majority of the world's population. So the obvious question then is, you know, given these facts, why hasn't race and racial justice attracted more attention within philosophy? And that brings us to the demography of the profession. Philosophy, this will be no news to anybody here, certainly not the philosophers, is one of the whitest of the humanities. So people of color underrepresented in the academy in general, in philosophy it's extreme. The number of Afri well, I shouldn't say African American, because it includes Afro Caribbean, such as myself, including African immigrants. The number of black people in philosophy, in professional philosophy, is about 130 in the entire country. The number of black women of those is about 30. So we're talking about 1%. So it means that when you have a conference on African American philosophy, people can't travel in the same plane. So there are 10 people in a plane, the plane goes down, that's in you know, a 10% of the black philosophical population <laughs> wiped out right there. And in the days when the APA um, you to have what's called the smoker, this was before Skype, when all the interviews took place there, and you go to this sort of you know, huge hotel ballroom, you need to put on your dark glasses, because there's sort of the huge hordes of white people everywhere, and you're likely to get snow blindness. And in fact, um, the analogy I've used, the problem is your analogies have to sort of keep up with the times. Um, I've told many audiences that I think of mainstream philosophy as something like Antarctica. It's a sort of giant, frozen, hostile white continent in which a few scattered figures of color try to make headway who are being blown back you know, by sort of gale force winds. But the problem is, as I say, your metaphors have to keep up with the times. And with global warming, my prediction is Antarctica is going to turn brown before philosophy does. <laughs> okay, so the demographic whiteness, no controversy, just a matter of numbers. Conceptual whiteness, that's a bit sort of harder to put your finger on, because what you're saying is that these narratives, these frameworks, these assumptions, these thought experiments, they're supposed to be universal, they're supposed to be abstract, all-inclusive. They're really predicated on the European and Euro-American experience. So in political philosophy in particular, the non-white political subject is assimilated to the white political subject without any attention played to the distinctive political experience of people of color in modernity, which is, as I remind you, an experience of expropriation, genocide, slavery, colonization, Jim Crow, etc. And the narratives of the evolution of liberalism that we tell sanitize the extent to which all these terms were inflected by race. The supposed ideology of individualism, egalitarianism, and universal rights and freedoms was far more often complicit with than in opposition to racism, colonialism, and white supremacy. We think of all the big boys, John Locke, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill, George Hegel, they all had racist views that arguably shaped the way their liberal principles applied across the colony. Self-ownership, that's Locke, Civilization, that's virtually all of them. Autonomy, personhood, that's Kant. Cultural development, Mill. Contributions to world history, Hegel. They're all seen as influenced by race. So in its hegemonic varieties, liberalism was racialized. And again, Losordo, or a more recent book, 
a guy called John Hobson. And for those of you who, in, probably very few people in the room will have gone through the sort of radical phase. Okay, for those oldest in, in the room who might remember um, Lenin's imperialism, high state of capitalism, and you recall he references one, you know, John Hobson. So this guy is his great grandson. He's sort of keeping up the good work. John M. Hobson, British guy, the Eurocentric conception of world politics, Western international theory over um, 250 years, and his point is to illustrate the extent to which racism and Eurocentrism have sort of shaped this body of thought from the beginning. So it's not that there were no anti-imperial varieties of liberal theory, and um, this husband and wife team that political theorists would know, Sanka Mutu and Jennifer Pitts, University of Chicago, they've done work on that, but the dominant varieties have been racialized. Nonetheless, what are liberals going to say, especially in philosophy? They're going to say, that was then, this is now. Today's liberalism has been purged of such racist exclusions. And my claim would be that we need to distinguish a purging that is merely a sanitization of the crucial terms and a purging that's going to be a reconceptualization of the body of thought to take the account, the experience of people of color into account. So again, as you see, my handout is filled with useful diagrams. Racial liberalism, that's a concept I'm proposing as equivalent to feminist theories, patriarchal liberal theory. And racial liberalism, I suggest, is, has two main forms. There's the overtly racist form of the past, and what I want to say is that there's a current form which is still alive and well, which is not overtly racist, but is still a racial form of liberalism because it's conceptually shaped and it's ethically oriented by the interests, perspectives, and priorities of the racially privileged. And my poster boy is going to be, gasp, John Rawls. John Rawls, a name you all know, I'm sure. Most famous 20th century liberal theorist. Huge influence on discussions of justice over the past 40 plus years. But alas, this influence has been negative as well as positive. So give him credit for the positive part. Theory of justice, his subsequent works, standardly give him the credit for the revival of Western political philosophy. Because the 1950s had been seen as moribund. This stuff was so boring, it's not merely that the people reading the articles tended to fall asleep, the people writing the articles tended to fall asleep. You know, you're composing, what is this? Oh, right, um, political obligation, yeah. Very tedious stuff. Rawls revives it so that the grand tradition is alive and well in a um, Plato, Aristotle, Hegel, Marx, etc. You can do grand theory once again. Resurrection of social contract theory in the form of a thought experiment. You choose behind the veil of ignorance principles of justice. Positive side, give Rawls credit for that. Here's the downside. Rawls' focus on social justice was basically a one-dimensional focus on the traditional left-right spectrum. In other words, on the issue of public versus private ownership of the means of production and where the sort of just balance point is. So he reinforced the already dominant tendency in the, in the discipline to marginalize gender justice and completely ignore racial justice. And the methodological decision to limit his discussion to ideal theory had the consequence of completely sidelining any discussion of corrective justice, which falls under non-ideal theory. So Rawls's work is, for me, a paradigm of racial liberalism. I'm not accusing Rawls of being a racist. Often in these talks, there's a Rawls disciple who starts to get furious and sort of turn red. And you know, I'm accusing their boy of being a racist. I'm not accusing Rawls of being a racist. I'm talking about being a member of a particular group in a particular time period, and how being a member of this group, sort of in you know, a white academics, white political philosophers, it shapes your horizons. It sort of limits what you can see. It gives you a set of priorities. White racial privilege orients the work of John Rawls. Through his silence on racism and white supremacy, the history of European imperialism, the Eurocentrism of his conceptual framework, and above all, the methodological focus on ideal theory. Racial justice, by its very nature, a matter of non-ideal theory. In Rawlsian language, race is created by the basic structure. A well-ordered society would not even have races as social existence. So the very existence of race means that the basic structure is already racialized, thereby requiring its radical reconstruction. So the very metaphysics of ideal theory is problematic from the start if you're going to try and deal with issues like race. So here's a long list of the whiteness 
longest of examples of the whiteness of Rawls and Rawlsianism. Prioritizing of ideal theory, which automatically excludes racial justice. Explicit concession. For me, this should have been printed in bold and in 24-point font. Explicit concession, justice as fairness, that the principle of justice, oh, by the way, guys, these principles of justice are not meant to apply to racist societies. So any of you who thought they were, you need to think again. Original failure, it's a point that Oaken made with respect to gender. Original failure to cite race as an identity behind the veil. Failure to recognize race as a transnational structure. Failure to mention the Atlantic slave trade in any of his work. Failure over five books to mention Native Americans in any of his work. Failure to condemn or even mention European imperialism and colonialism. One of his students, one of his best known students, Thomas Pogan, points out that the way Rawls explains different levels of national development could be seen as explanatory nationalism. Why are some nations rich and some nations are poor? Well, it's because of their national cultures and traditions. Those feckless Jamaicans, it's all that smoking ganja on the beach. That's why they're poor. It's nothing to do with slavery and British imperialism and colonialism. It's their national traditions. So you basically get an account which sort of it dispenses with sort of history, European domination, imperialism, colonialism, slavery, all that stuff. And here's one, what is perhaps the most startling fact. Bearing in mind that this is the go-to guy for social justice in American political philosophy of the second half of the 20th century. There is nowhere in any of Rawls' five books the phrase affirmative action, the most important post-war measure of corrective racial justice in the United States. So that's an indication of the whiteness of Rawlsianism, not biologically understood, but as the experience, as the orientation, as life world of the racially privileged subset of human beings in a system of racial domination. So for racial liberalism, its original racist version, you have a racialized social ontology in conjunction with Eurocentric cartography, underpinned by your triumphalism, and that justifies a color-coded schedule of rights, protections, and freedoms so that people of color are denied equal status. Rawls himself, of course, would repudiate any such racist restrictions. That's why it's important to be clear on what the nature of my accusation is. I'm not for a second saying Rawls would endorse that. But what I'm saying is that in failing to confront their legacy, he and Rawlsians contribute to their perpetuation. And my example here is a big handbook, the Blackwell Companion to Rawls, edited by John Mandel and David Reading, which came out in 2014, nearly 600 pages. And in this book, there are one and a half pages on race. And it's not a matter of racial justice, it's a matter of listing negative racial indicators. And if you look up affirmative action in the index, you will get, and I kid you not, you will get a single sentence. Affirmative action, C, page 183, note whatever, a single sentence. But, and this is where I sort of turn things around, so accusation, I then say, nonetheless, we can retrieve things. Once we separate the normative core of liberalism from the contingent versions of B, C, D, and E, a deracialized liberalism is possible. So it's not inconsistent with liberalism that to guarantee the moral equality, freedom, and possible self-realization of all individuals, that we self-consciously take into account their group memberships, how they're illicitly privileged or subordinated by them, and develop accordingly mappings of society and the polity that accurately track political and economic domination in the light of the actual history of these groups and the legacy of that history in the present, thereby providing an informed basis upon which to prescribe rights, protections, freedoms, anti-discrimination provisions, and appropriate corrective measures. Indeed, it could be argued that taking into account such factors is not merely permissible, but mandated by any serious commitment to liberal social justice. And what would such a racially conscious liberalism be? It would be, and the paradox here is only apparent, it would be a non-racial liberalism. It's a present, nominally race-blind liberalism that is, in fact, the racialized version of liberal theory. So how do we do this? Well, here's my suggestion. So turn now to page eight. What we're going to do is take Rawls's apparatus and modify it. So Rawls revives a social contract, not of course in a literal form, but as a device of representation. And the essence, the valuable core I suggest, is the idea that you're going to use veiled prudential choice, so that's in you know, a choice behind the veil of ignorance, 
and you're going to sort of come up with principles of justice, some sort of general pattern, central liberal values, contracts with advice of representation, principle of justice. So for those people, the sort of very small minority of us working on race within um, sort of mainstream political philosophy, the strategy has then been, we'll sort of twiddle with these principles of justice to come up with principles of racial justice. My friend Tommy F Shelby, who many of you know, I'm sure, black philosopher at Harvard, this has been Tommy's strategy. I have a great respect for Tommy, very smart guy, I agree with him on a lot of stuff, but this particular area, I'm in disagreement with him on. And my suggestion is that rather than do that, we develop an alternative strategy and we run a different thought experiment. So we basically sort of split it sort of two separate enterprises and we sort of have them clearly demarcated visually so we can see the conceptual difference between them. On the left hand side, we have the ideal theory story. And you basically sort of trying to derive there principles of ideal distributive justice to construct an ideal basic structure. And that gives you a theory of justice sort of in a vast Rawlsian um, body of secondary literature. And what I'm suggesting we do is run a different thought experiment for non-ideal theory. And what we're trying to come up with there are principles of ideal corrective racial justice to dismantle a racialized basic structure. And my claim is that this is a better strategy for arriving at principles of racial justice than trying to derive them from in a PDJ1 and PDJ2, whose, whose aim is not to come up with principles of corrective justice. So the thought experiment has been applied to a different end, not how you would construct an ideal basic structure from ground zero, but how you would dismantle an already existing unjust basic structure. So the thought experiment plays itself out differently. Self-knowledge is still blocked by the veil, so we can get sort of prudential choice as something sort of, not sort of um, motivate us, but the veil is somewhat thinner on social knowledge. We know we're going to emerge into a society whose basic structure has historically been shaped by white supremacy. So all the social variants among which we choose will have a white supremacy state as their ancestor. An ideal society is not an option for us. So we're now making a self-interested choice about different principles of corrective justice that will correct a greater or lesser degree for this history of racial domination. So the question you're going to ask yourself is the following. What kind of measures would you endorse to correct for a history of racial injustice, worried that when the veil lifts, you're going to be a member of one of the subordinated races? What recommendations would you make for altering the legal and political system the structure of economic opportunities, the dominant cognitive and evaluative norms, the cultural patterns, the somatic ideal, the social ontology of racial superiority and inferiority. In other words, you're going to ask yourself, the veil lifts, and I'm a black guy on the south side of Chicago. The veil lifts, and I'm a Native American on the reservation. The veil lifts, and I'm a Latina somewhere in the southwest. In other words, you're screwed, to use technical philosophical language. <laughs> and the question then is, what public policy measures are you going to want to see put in place by the state to correct as far as possible for this position of racial subordination in which you find yourself? So that rather than racial justice being the side issue that you never get to, racial justice is up front and central. So what form might it take? Well, here I have some sketchy suggestions drawing on the areas of society that Rawls demarcates. So on the left-hand column, we have Rawls's principles, which remind you of principles of ideal distributive justice to construct an ideal basic structure for society as a cooperative venture. So there's the basic liberties principle, and that regulates primary goods in terms of our rights, our civic rights as a citizen. And then in terms of the material realm, economic opportunities, there's a fair opportunity versus difference principle that regulates material primary social goods. And then Rawls says that self-respect, which is a primary good, is then going to sort of fall out of the fact that you have these principles applied. Consider now a non-ideal society, a society which is not, does not have its birth in society as a cooperative venture, but rather society as an exploitative venture a society which structurally privileges whites at the expense of people of color. What principles of corrective justice do you need that are going to correspond to these areas? 
well in terms of your civic status, principle of corrective justice number one, you're going to sort of need to end racially unequal citizenship. People of color as non-citizens or second-class citizens without equal political input into the governing process or equal status in everyday interactions, such as with the police. Second area, economic opportunities. And so there's the principle here, end racial exploitation. By racial exploitation, I mean the history of systemic white advantage that has produced differential racialized concentrations of wealth and poverty that tend to perpetuate themselves intergenerationally, whether through continuing discrimination, opportunity hoarding, or even without discriminatory intent because of residential segregation, inferior schooling, diminished chance to accumulate social capital, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, I'm going to suggest that whereas Rawls only needs his two principles because he's assuming a society of the cooperative venture in which people give each other reciprocal Kantian respect, in the case of a racist society, it's different because a racist society is founded on the principle of disrespect for the subordinate races. So you're going to need a sort of active principle of justice that is targeted at that legacy of you know, racial disrespect. And in terms of what these come out to in practice, well, think, for example, of, um, so here it's going to be somewhat dated. Um, maybe the older people in the audience will remember. Think of you know, the first Clinton and think of the, uh, the nomination of Lenny Guinier as Attorney General, and then what happened when the political right discovered the paper trail of her writings. So Lenny Guinier, Harvard Law School, her position was that if you want to achieve a liberal democratic ideal in a racist society such as the United States, you're going to sort of take account of actual white voting patterns. And one of Madison's concerns, as you recall, was permanent majorities, not of a racial kind, of course. I mean, those, those were okay, but permanent majorities of another kind. And Bonaire says what you have in the US is in effect a permanent white majority in terms of voting patterns, in terms of people are going to vote for, and what's going to mean in terms of underrepresentation of people of color in governing bodies. So her suggestion is that we're going to need corrective measures, such as, for example, supermajority voting, cumulative voting, etc which seems to be a violation of liberal democratic ideals, except arguably they're not. They're, they're an attempt to achieve liberal democratic ideals in non-ideal circumstances of white domination. Um, in terms of B, racial exploitation, well, of course, there's been a large amount of literature on this because of, of, of um, you know, the resurrection of re reparations this year by Coates Atlantic article. So in a case to be made for reparations, that basically, you know, whites are sort of benefiting from this history of racial domination, the sort of structure of racial exploitation, and that you'll never be able to achieve genuine equality unless, you know, this is somehow corrected for. And then finally, racial disrespect. Well, think of all the debates we've had in, you know, sort of the past few months about, you know, Eurocentric histories, you know, the textbook wars, education programs that are necessary to correct for widespread implicit bias. Think of the racial disrespect manifest in Southern Civil War monuments, Confederate flag displays, you know, the controversy at you know, Ivy League institutions last year about buildings being named after famous segregationists, etc. All of this, I suggest, can be sort of put under the category of racial disrespect. And if you think of how central respect was for Kant, if you think of the sort of ideal of you know, um, a liberal theory of a deontological kind, which was sort of inspired you know, by sort of you know, Kantian spirit, you can then see that there's a whole variety of issues that sort of you know, come under your scrutiny once you sort of take into account the real world history rather than the fantasy history that is taught in our textbooks. So you put this all together <clears throat> and you would get the ending of racial injustice and I suggest that the likelihood, the likely outcome is an elimination of races as social existence. So what you're doing in Rawlsian language, you're treating race as a basic structure of the modern world, not just locally in countries like the US, but globally, which basically illicitly advantages whites at the expense of people of color and is then going to need to be corrected for by, by principles that rather than Rawlsian principles which sort of abstract away from race that are empirically and conceptually sensitized to this history. So the idea would then be you can use a mainstream apparatus, you can use the most prestigious justice apparatus in political thought for the past 40 years to do racial justice. 
So I hope when you see me, you will not cross the street because of the disgusting way I've sold out. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is how we, well, so many people here. So the, we'll proceed as follows. Um, if you have a question, you raise your hand, uh, and then we'll have somebody walking around with um, uh, a microphone. Uh, keep in mind that if we don't get to your question, there's a reception afterwards uh, with Professor Mills, so there'll still be a chance to, uh, to have a conversation, okay? Professor Mills, thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the theoretical task at hand here uh, to serve as a corrective for illiberal liberalism is to disentangle the normative core from its historical variants. Yeah. Uh, however, the concept of the individual, which is almost always historicized and abstract, corresponds to the five components that of liberalism that you mentioned on page two. Uh, and it is upon this concept, of course, that liberalism's differential social ontologies are founded and derived. My question to you is, is this uh, the concept of, if of the individual so central to liberal thought, is it actually, can we actually historicize this concept so it doesn't exist abscise from the historical realities of the folks who, whom the concept of the individual are supposed to refer to. Um, and if we could therefore put this into conversation with concepts of collectivities, which are often historicized, um, and um, not replicate the same type of historical distortions of yes, certainly. liberalism. The thing to recognize is that the contractarian strain of liberalism is not the only variety. And um, I, um, I have another friend, um, Derek Darby, who sort of works in these areas. And Derek has a book in which he argues that liberals need to sort of resurrect the liberalism of the British Hegelians, of T.H. Green and others in the late 19th century. And this liberalism was very much a social liberalism, which the individual is not sort of conceived of as abstracted out of society and history, but as somebody sort of very much shaped by these interactions. Um, a downside of this approach, I would claim, is that insufficient attention is paid to domination and subordination. So I want a social ontology for liberalism that is both social, socialized, as against atomic individualists, but is also sensitive to historical domination and subordination. And you don't really get that from Green. But my argument is that if you sort of conceive of liberalism that's going to sort of take those things into account, then you get a liberalism in which the individual can be conceptualized in such a way as to sort of advance this kind of project. Can we try to keep the questions just brief so we can get in a good number of them, okay? Yeah. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so I wanna try to wedge apart the ideal distributive justice principles and the ideal corrective racial justice principles. Okay. Um, so beyond, behind the veil of ignorance, by your account, there aren't yet moral considerations, so it's prudential it's reason. Correct, yes. Um, so what is, why doesn't um, the prince, why doesn't the metaphilosophical idea of just corrective justice of comparing the society when I'm making the decision to the society as it develops, why doesn't that generalize perfectly? Um, so if I have a 13% chance of being, uh, of being born in a place that uh, doesn't Conscious. filter the sure, thanks, yeah. Yeah. yeah, um good question, which people have asked me in the past. The veil has to be, the veil has to be somewhat delicately constructed. The veil has to be thin enough that you know you're going to enter a white supremacist state, but thick enough that you don't know the balance of the population, because you're absolutely right. Um, on the one hand, let's say United States of 50 years ago, you could figure, I'm going to take my chance, I'm going to end up as a white guy, as against sort of apartheid South Africa, where it's just like 12 or 13%. So yes, you want to sort of eliminate those kind of calculations just as Rawls did. So you need, need a veil which is sort of in a carefully 
or it's a metaphor carefully woven, carefully knitted, so that it sort of shows you a white supremacy state, but doesn't actually tell you the percentage of whites. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the mechanics of the non-ideal contract. Yes, sure. So in the ideal contract, right, um, for Rawls and for a lot of social contract theorists, there's no real disagreement. Every perspective is the same insofar as it's rational. I'm wondering in your contract, is it real disagreement that people then come to these principles or is it sort of everyone in your scenario would see the same things? Okay, in theory, the idea would be that um, you're going to be moved by you know, the fear that you're going to sort of enter a society of racial domination and you're not going to be a member of the dominant race. So if part, as you know, there's a kind of, you know, um, Rawls talks about we have general knowledge, um, and then I would want to sort of say we need sort of more than that sort of general knowledge, which you know, um, is sort of very vague and abstract. You're going to need a, a, a knowledge of the history of racist societies and the kind of indignities that they're sort of subject in the racial subordinated to. So this then is going to sort of concentrate your mind wonderfully behind the veil, and you're going to think, Jesus Christ, the veil lifts I'm, as I said, I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to be Native American on the reservation, I'm going to sort of this black guy in the ghetto or whatever. I don't want to be that guy. Therefore, what do I need to do? I need to sort of make sure that the state is going to be implementing corrective measures so that I can exit the ghetto, so that I, I can have sort of equal status um, in the party as a whole and so forth. So in theory, at least, you know, you would also want it to be the case that it's going to be a kind of convergence once people sort of take into account this history. Thanks for your great talk. I wondered if you could say a little bit about what um, the stakes of your disagreement with Tommy Shelby are um, with the diagrams on page eight. Sure. Since, since it seems like Tommy Shelby could say, well, the, the P1 and P2 that I generate are just going to have output something that has the same mm -hmm. content effectively as your uh, principles of corrective justice. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, I can actually point you towards an article. Okay, so Tom is out with respect to what I'm thinking of. The Fordham Law Review in 2004 had a special issue on roles, and you know, they had four people writing on race, and Tommy was one of those. So I'm speaking specifically of that article. So I have a critique of him, which goes into detail, which appears in this new journal, Critical Philosophy of Race, volume one, number one, and then Tommy has a reply to me in volume one, number two, and the paper I'm presenting to the philosophy department tomorrow um, is in part a reply to him. So, you know, Critique, reply, critique, reply. So in, this, in, in his original article, Tommy argues that fair equality of opportunity, um, you know, the sort of, you know, part of the second principle of justice, Rawls only uses it for class, but he's saying that it can be expanded to accommodate race. So the idea is that people of similar levels of ability should have equal chances, and Rawls says, you know, so you therefore want that working class kids get access to high quality education, et cetera, et cetera. So Thomas says, it's true Rawls doesn't talk about corrective justice. Nonetheless, can't we sort of press hard on, you know, fair equality of opportunity and bring race into the mix? And he presses so hard that he thinks you can even get reparations out of it. You can get sort of transfers of wealth. And then my claim is that this is a violation of what Rawls intended and that, in fact, a category mistake is involved insofar as fair equality of opportunity is a principle for ideal theory and Rawls says specifically that race and gender come under non-ideal theory. And my argument is, I mean, I basically raise um, five points of objection. And, you're, and you're, one of the first ones is, had it been the case that race could have been covered under fair equality of opportunity, Rawls would have just said so. Because you know, it's sort of a sort of a kind of straightforward implication if you know, these principles could in fact be used that way. But my argument is that it can't be used that way because he's basically talking about a situation where um, you know, it's the moral arbitrariness of you know, our um, natural um, assets and our class position, and that's in a sort of conceptually different location from being in a subordinate position in society because of social oppression. And part of my argument is that the social oppression should be able to sort of attract an audience that's not just the left liberal side, side as in Rawls, but across the political spectrum, which is why Robert Nozick has corrective justice as part of his you know, three principles of justice. So my claim would be that you know, Tommy is mislocating 
the particular kind of moral wrong involved. And that, you know, racial oppression is not a matter of, you know, morally arbitrary traits locating at a, at a particular level, but of social oppression. But as I say, the sort of detailed argument is, is in, is in this, this, this exchange between him and Nasser. Hello, um, thank you for a really engaging talk. Um, my question, I don't know, I'm hoping it's really quick, but um, my question is, if race is so intrinsic to the origin and modern conception of liberalism, then once we achieve the task of, um, of deracializing liberalism, what essential facets of liberalism are left such that we may call it liberalism? And um, if one of those uh, essential facets are, um, is, a universal definition of um, what it means to be human, then how, if we are trying to um, disentangle that with the Western conception of humanity, then how, what are we recentering it on if we're trying to recenter it at all, I guess? Well, my claim would be that um, what you will get is a liberalism that lives up to sort of in a classic self-conception as this ideology which is sort of best, best um, suited to advance a humanist agenda, that you know, the ideal of individual flourishing, of you know, um, due process, everybody being equal before the law. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. This is good stuff. It's just that you know, it's been applied historically in a discriminatory way. So what you will get, I would claim, is a liberalism that finally, well, I mean, I've, I've been focused just on race here, but, it, but the argument goes through for other things as well. You get a liberalism that actually does what it said it would, would do. So it's not the case that it then sort of dissipates into nothingness. Um, the actual liberalism that we've known has been sort of so identified with these structures of domination, it's easy to sort of let it limit our horizons and imagine this is what liberalism has to be. But the point of the sort of, you know, um, on page two, sort of saying these sort of five components is to enable us to see that the reason they've developed the way they have is not because of an intrinsic dynamic that's sort of in a part of the theory. It's an external account in terms of the particular groups who are dominant. So, you know, you have male domination. This manifests itself in a liberalism that's patriarchal. You have white domination, you have a liberalism that's racial. So I want to sort of locate the explanation in an externalist account rather than intern an account that's sort of internal. Thank you. Um, most, uh, most surveys seem to indicate in the not too distant future the, the number of people of color in this country will outnumber uh, the number of white people. Sure. What are the implications uh, of, of that phenomenon going to uh, have on liberalism and racial justice? Sure, okay, very good question. Um, to begin with, it's not as straightforward as one might think, um, because part of the question is how do you define whiteness? And um, historically in the US, um, there have been ambiguities about who counts, if not as white, at least as fully white. So that um, in terms of patterns of discrimination against the Irish, against the Jews, against Eastern and Southern Europeans, there's some people have argued that these um, ethnic European groups were not actually white at all. I think that analysis is wrong. There's another analysis which says they were white, but white race was not a monolith, rather it was a hierarchy. So some white races were superior to others. And it's really only after World War II and the exit to the suburbs that you sort of get the old ethnic neighborhoods breaking up and you get, a, you get the emergence of a kind of homogeneous white race. Nonetheless, it sort of brings home to us the extent to which whiteness is sort of you know, flexible and in flux. So one of the things we need to remember is the extent to which um, many Latinos in the US are of European origin and they self-identify racially as white. So ethnically they say they're Latino, but you know, racially they say they're white. And there's a well-known sociologist, um, po black Puerto Rican guy, Eduardo Bonilla Silva at um, Duke. And Eduardo's prediction is that the US is going to follow the Latin model of race. And the Latin model, rather than being sort of a sharply demarcated white versus non-white, the most important one white component being blacks as determined by the one drop rule, the Latin model has classically been called pigmentocracy. So you have, you know, whites, sort of light browns, and then you have the darker. 
And what this means that in Brazil, for example, um, pretos and pardos are two separate categories. So browns and blacks are separate categories. So whereas in the US, one drop rule means that, you know, I'm black, you know, um, Femme is black, you know, all people of these different shades, we all count as black. In Latin America, it's different. And what the consequence has been, it's been very difficult to get off the ground a sort of, you know, unifying black civil rights movement because of the sort of desire of people to, to identify away from blackness. So Eduardo's prediction that the U.S. is going to sort of move in this direction, that the boundaries of whiteness are going to be expanded, maybe to include Euro-Latinos, maybe you know, some Asian groups and possibly, who knows, even some light-skinned blacks, and you're then going to get a racial system which is going to be able to present itself as having these people of color at sort of high levels, but will continue to be the case that the bottom is going to be the darker. So that's going to be sort of much harder to fight. So it would be great if you know, the problems are going to be solved by the demographic shift, but sort of this shows you know, that it's not necessarily going to be the case. And the other thing, of course, is that as a South African example showed, you can be a white minority and still hold on to power for a long time. So blacks have the vote since 1994. I was in South Africa in um, 2014. Um, as somebody old enough to have taken part in um, anti-apartheid activis activism in grad school, I was shocked to find that many blacks now think of Mandela as an Uncle Tom. Uh, Mandela basically sold us out to, to whites. So it goes to show the extent to which whites have continued to hold on, on to power all these years after the formal abolition of apartheid. And I think there are stats that show that the gap between white, either white and black incomes or white and black wealth is now greater than it was under apartheid. So I don't think the demographic shift is going to lead to a sort of automatic solution to, the, to these problems. It's going to sort of potentially increase the constituency of people with a vested interest in racial justice. But given, the, given where the heads of many white people are now, and there's this um, survey that came out about three years ago. So they asked white Americans, which race do you think is most likely to be subject to racial discrimination? And the answer was white people. So white people are a sort of new oppressed race. And of course, if white people become a minority, it sort of strengthen the case for their oppression. So with that kind of conception of, you know, um, that's a kind of very sort of, you know, unrealistic sort of view of where whites are positioned in the economy, it means it's sort of hard to make a case for racial justice. The Black Lives Movement has sort of brought some stuff onto the agenda that you know, had previously been sort of you know, kept quiet. So that's positive. But I think it's going to be a very difficult period. And, you know, what is ideal is that there should be sort of transracial organization. So it doesn't seem like a sort of white versus people of color thing. It should be sort of transracial organizing, those interested in racial justice, those you know, not interested in racial justice, but you definitely want it to be an interracial coalition of folks who sort of perceive the necessity for correcting for this sort of long, sad history. Excellent. So I think it's time now for us to uh, move to the reception where we can continue the conversation. So please join me once again in thanking Professor Charles Miller.